Good morning. What I was hoping to do today is talk a little bit about the practical implications of uh, big data in terms of how we at IMS see it interacting with evidence generation in healthcare. A little bit of background on our experience that informs uh, the, the topic today. Um, we at IMS have been working on around the big data space in healthcare, particularly around patient analytics since the 90s. Uh, today, the company processes about 38 billion unique healthcare transactions a year globally. Uh, we touch about 80% of all the pharmacy that's distributed uh, across the world. And we maintain uh, an active database of patient longitudinal data representing around 260 million uh, people, of which about 244 are in the US. So the, 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 a lot of the problems that, that we as, a, as an industry and a lot of the problems we're facing in healthcare today uh, around how to manage this big data are things that we've been grappling with uh, for a number of years. What I'm hoping to do is to kind of draw this back a little bit to some thematics that we've observed uh, sort of sit on top of all of the, the types of problems that we're facing and a lot of the solutions that we're proposing. And, uh, what we sort of do is we bucket them into really three categories, technical challenges, access challenges, and policy challenges. Um, the first uh, challenge to keep in mind when we talk about how to, to measure things like outcomes is to contextualize whether the outcome we care about is an individual outcome or a population outcome. Most of the measures that we create today as an industry are really focused on measuring uh, effect over a population. But if I'm a patient, that's not really applicable to me. What I care about is individual outcome. I care about who's gonna be the best physician for myself. I care about uh, what's the best drug that I should be on. And I care about what's gonna create the best individual outcome for a family member. Uh, so I think that we need to be very conscious when we think about how to leverage this data as to what the intended purpose is. The second is around uh, the sort of butterfly effect, the idea that you can get highly divergent conclusions uh, based on small differences in your initial uh, state. As data proliferates through the system and as more stakeholders have the ability to run their own analyses, what you're gonna see is highly divergent conclusions around the same questions. And in many cases, those may be legitimate uh, differences. In some cases, they may be different conclusions because of subtle differences in population characteristics, data source, uh, or methodology and other analytic techniques that are used. New data types. I think that as an industry, we've been trained historically to work with data that's produced as a byproduct of the payment or the clinical system. So think healthcare claims and think about data coming out of a chart of some sort. Uh, but I think that as, you, as we see the market evolve, we have to be cognizant that there's gonna be additional data that becomes useful for better understanding uh, patient behavior and outcomes, things like social media data, uh, remote monitoring or sensor data, other types of machine data, data that is an industry we're not particularly well adapted to deal with. Um, there's still a significant gap, in our opinion, around methodologies, tools, workforce, and quality measures. Uh, methodologies, in other words, how do we deal with these big, messy, real-world data sets that have uh, a lot of missing data and a mix of both structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data? So what are the techniques that we're gonna use as research scientists to actually work with that information? Uh, tools, what are the types of uh, tool sets and software that we can use to better industrialize the process of working with this complex and very large data? Uh, workforce, I think that we've all observed the idea that the data scientist, somebody who's effectively a generalist of sorts, has become a much more prominent player. And I think as an industry, we, we know that there's not enough of these people. And lastly, quality measures. Um, most of the quality measures that have been developed are really focused on uh, process measures, what was done. Not as many quality measures that have been developed have focused on what we believe are real true outcomes measures. The reason this is relevant is because quality measures are the currency in trade for how we measure progress in many cases between stakeholders and healthcare delivery. Uh, the second that I would also posit around quality measures is that most of the measures that have been developed that are process measures actually measure uh, gaps in care or underuse as opposed to overuse. Uh, there's a scarcity of measures for a lot of the specialties that are out there. 
So I think there needs to be an active goal of how do we better develop measures that can be uh, proliferated through the system. And in addition, for patients, most of these measures are not terribly meaningful. There's not a lot of measures out there that really focus on safety, as an example, or what represents quality to an individual patient. Um, the healthcare data infrastructure, I think was, we touched on it briefly earlier, but the thing that I would actually point out as uh, people from outside of our industry tend, uh, start to engage more in how to try to fix some of these problems, I would actually observe it's less like uh, sort of internet 2.0 and more like the air traffic control system. It's a highly stable, inefficient, but mission critical set of subsystems that we need to think about how those are gonna modify over time. Uh, the other is around whether or not there's a disruptive change limit in healthcare. One of the things that I've observed and I don't have an answer to is why technology uh, and innovation diffusion in healthcare takes so long. And I'll just give you one case in point. Um, electronic prescribing, which has been around since the 90s, we would all agree, based on the last slide that we saw from the last presenter, uh, solves a lot of very uh, helpful problems. As recently as in 2008, according to ShareScripts, there was about 60 some odd million prescriptions generated electronically. Uh, last year, that number had grown to about 200 and, or 570 million prescriptions, which seems like a big number until you consider that it only represents about 14% of all the prescriptions in the United States. So in 14 years, we've gotten to about 14% of all prescribing. Um, Again, another topic that we covered before, but is the, the sort of number of available sources of data. You have a proliferation of data sources out there, and the challenge of actually getting data out of a lot of these different systems uh, becomes complicated. I'll give you one concrete example. Um, there's about 450 EMRs that are meaningful use certified. There's 135 or so that have over 30 practices that have attested for meaningful use. 135, how many other industries have 135 vendors that have any reasonable scale? The last I'll talk about is uh, policy. Uh, the first is around information asymmetry. Uh, and by that, what we mean is that as the world moves towards a model where uh, you have to move risk from one party to another, the idea that one party knows more about things like how drugs work than another party does creates information asymmetry. That's a problem that needs to be solved if we're really gonna have sort of fair trading on how we deal with risk. Uh, the prove-it era. Pharmaceuticals have moved from the market access era where manufacturers controlled the evidence uh, to a world where they now have to justify not only safety and efficacy but value. Uh, privacy, I think, is an obvious one that often gets overlooked as we create these very large data sets the, uh, the uh, potential for re-identification and the potential for misuse becomes magnified, and I think we need to be very cognizant that while the data beco can become extremely powerful, it also comes with a set of risks and a set of responsibilities. And the last point that I'll talk about is uh, regulatory versus real world, and by that what I mean is that in many cases what we're doing around real, real world data and evidence is moving much faster than the regulatory framework that sits behind it in terms of how drugs are actually approved, as an example, how drugs are monitored, and how they're reimbursed. The last thing I'll leave you with is just a brief top line on what we've done at IMS to create sort of a working structure that we kind of propose as a holistic view of how we treat a lot of these issues when we think about uh, acquiring real-world data for research purposes. And basically what we've done is we've really created four categories of thematics that we think capture the right kinds of topics underneath this that as a framework help us to better leverage all of the internal data we get access to to be much more efficient in the industrialization of the production process uh, of the work that we're doing. So I hope that was helpful, thank you.